James, welcome back to another video. In this video, I am off to explore the lost canal that came right into the center of Halifax. I'm starting the journey crossing this uh, bridge which goes over the old goods yard at Halifax railway station, uh, now the site of Eureka uh, and the uh, Eureka car parks. Behind me is the uh, short cobbled lane, uh, Lily Lane, which from what I can gather from old maps uh, was a road that actually went down, must have been quite steep, down into the, to the valley bottom. But with the coming of the railways in the 1850s, uh, it was all uh, banked up uh, and levelled out uh, to, to make way for the station and the goods yards. And I'm guessing that that's why this sort of rather weird random bridge uh, is in place uh, to give access to what would have been Lily Lane. Okay, so I'm going to head down over the bridge, uh, down into the valley bottom, uh, and start looking for this lost canal. Easy to see why this path isn't on the uh, tourist trail. So I'm in the valley bottom, behind me is the embankment that was built for the railway uh, and I am across from the Nestle factory, um, it was originally the site of uh, John McIntosh's chocolate and toffee company, creators of Quality Street, um, later became Roundtree Macintosh, uh, and then in the 1980s became part of the Nestle group. So if we look on the side-by-side -side map, we can see um, the canal basin, a large canal basin coming into the town uh, next to the railway station on the left. But as we can see from the Google Earth image, uh, there's nothing here. So what happened to the canal? If we head towards the factory complex, we might start to get some clues about this long lost canal. That, if I'm not mistaken, is an old sign, perhaps indicating an entrance to Halifax Railway Station. No idea when that was last in use, but it looks a bit of a dark, dingy and not very safe entrance into the railway station. So back to the canal. Uh, let's wander down to the entrance to the uh, Nestle factory site. First clue, uh, Navigation Road, uh, the road or the, the entrance into what is now the uh, Nestle factory down here at the bottom of Halifax. Obviously not going to go walking in, private property, um, but we're going to head back down the footpath uh, and see if we can see uh, any remnants of the canal. So I follow the original path uh, around the complex that you can still see on the old map. Uh, I'm coming up close to the uh, Nestle factory itself, staying safely on the other side of the fence of course, and where I am looking from here would have been the site of the canal basin, the terminus of the Halifax arm of the Cauldron Hebel. Clearly nothing there, all being built on, um, long gone underneath uh, the factory, uh, the chocolate factory that is now part of Nestle. So there's no evidence there, the, the canal basin, the canal wharf, all being built on, lost under modern factories. Uh, can't obviously go into the site to start having an explore around there, so I'm going to follow the path, follow the Hebble Brook, uh, follow the old map and see what we can find, if anything, is left of the Halifax branch, Halifax arm of the Cauldron Hebble Canal.
So we know where it ends. Uh, it ends uh, in the Nestlé factory under modern factory buildings. There's no trace of the canal left there, apart from the only clue being in the name uh, Navigation Road, heading down to uh, what would have been the terminus of the Halifax Canal. But before we set off, what was the Halifax Canal? Well, it was actually the Halifax branch, or the Halifax arm, of the Cauldron Hebel navigation. Uh, the Cauldron Hebel runs for about 21 miles from Wakefield, where it leaves the River Calder, or parts of the River Calder were made navigable, uh, all the way through to Sorby Bridge. Salter Hebel, about a mile and a half outside the town, was the original terminus. The canal uh, reached there and was opened in 1765. The final section, onwards towards Sorby Bridge, opened five years later in 1770. There it connected with the Rochdale Canal, which I believe opened fully in about 1804. Uh, so you could go from Wakefield through Sorby Bridge, across the Pennines, through Rochdale, into Manchester. Halifax was a growing industrial town, but it didn't have access to the canal, making the movement of uh, goods and raw materials reliant on horse traffic, uh, and the terrain around the town, the town was, was pretty steep. Uh, other nearby towns were embracing steam power rather than water, uh, and this required lots and lots of coal. Uh, the nearest point for Halifax to the canal was at Salter Hebel, where we're going to finish up today. Uh, to bring the canal into the town would have meant negotiating a height difference of about 100 feet within a very short distance. As well as the difference in height over such a short distance, less than two miles, other problems included the, uh, the canal, the channel that was needed for the canal was very rocky, uh, there wasn't much water, the, the Hebel Brook isn't a, uh, a vast river and there was also a pressure uh, uh, on, on the, the canal company because uh, local mill owners were not going to give up their water supply easily. Uh, nothing much happened for a long time, about 50 years, uh, and then an Act of Parliament was passed in 1825. Uh, and the canal was finally built and opened in 1828. Didn't bother with the Hebel at all, in fact a brand new channel was cut through uh, the rocky terrain, uh, a brand new canal, it needed 14 locks to bring it up that 100 feet in height difference in a distance of about a mile and a half. It cost £58,000 to build a short canal under two miles long, whereas the original whole 20 mile stretch from Wakefield had cost £75,000. Uh, so as a result, tolls from Salt Hebel up to Halifax would double the normal rate. Okay, so I've walked down the cantilever path. Uh, the Hebel Brook is to my right, this side. Uh, and we're heading down to, back to where we started, uh, where we came down at Lily Bridge, Lily Lane. Right, I've headed down Waterside and I'm heading to Water Lane um, where the canal was running over here. All industrial buildings, industrial land, uh, no trace of the canal at all. Um, so I'll just get to Water Lane and then see where we go from here. Okay, so I'm at Water Lane. Uh, from where I'm standing, it's hard to imagine that there was, uh, there was ever a canal here. Uh, looking north towards the basin, there would have been a lock. Uh, and looking south, there would have been a widening of the canal looking towards the demolished Atlas Carpet Works. Uh, it's been infilled, built on. The Hebel Brook still flows underneath. Uh, we can still follow the direction of the canal, even though there's very little evidence uh, where we are at the minute. Uh, I'm going to cross the road and pick up what is known as the Hebel Trail. Uh, parts of the path, uh, especially up this, these early stages, are pretty neglected. Uh, we're going to cross over the road, we're going to go over the, under the buildings, we're going to keep the river to my right uh, and we're going to follow uh, the river to the bottom of Sedbra Road. in this little stretch I think it's, uh, it's best probably just to keep moving.
run along here where I'm looking I think there would have been the lock from what I can gather from the map I would have been looking at uh, one of the locks now long gone uh, the land has been built on infilled I'm not sure at what sort of level that it's been built up on private land gates I'm not going to trespass, so I'm going to pick up the path again at the side of the Hebel Brook. And our next stop is Shaw Lodge Mills. So I've emerged from uh, that little section of track at uh, Boys Bridge, uh, which is just below the mills of Holdsworth's uh, Shore Lodge Mills. Um, there would have been a lock here. Uh, it's all been filled in. There's no evidence uh, of canal looking north behind me. However, if we take a short walk around the corner and up the hill, We can clearly see uh, the arch uh, of the bridge under which the canal would have flowed. All been filled in, um, but we can definitely see the arch uh, from this side of the bridge, uh, along with that modern phenomenon, that disgusting habit of fly tipping. So as we're looking down here, that would have been the line Canal. Inaccessible, uh, possibly private property. So I'm going to head over Boys Bridge towards Shaw Lodge Mills. Hill. A uh, long time since I had a couple of pints down at the Shears. Used to be a really nice little local pub. Uh, gather it still is. walked through uh, Shaw Lodge Mills, um, hugely impressive complex, now Grade 2 listed, uh, worth looking at. It was home to John Holdsworth and Sons, a company I believe that lasted well into the 2000s. Um, there was a failed plan uh, to redevelop it into property and apartments around about the time of the financial crash 2008, but that never um, seemed, to, seemed to kick off. So the complex grew and grew and grew, uh, steam engines added, new machinery added, um, at one point I believe it even had its own gas, work to, gas works to supply um, lighting into the factory. Uh, we're going to head on now to our next stop which is Phoebe Lane. More fly tipping. We're at Phoebe Lane, uh, here we can pick up the Hebel Trail again um, and we can also pick up the alignment of the canal. We can also see behind us at the top of the hill uh, was the Phoebe Lane pumping station, uh, more of which a little bit later on. So behind me we can see what would have been the alignment of the canal. 
there would have been a lock just at the other side of Phoebe Lane um, where the canal went under a bridge and then picked up this section here of the Hebble Trail uh, and we're going to walk down the next section down to Bottoms. It's only at this point really that the uh, Hebble Trail becomes user friendly, uh, tarmac, flat, cycle friendly, walking friendly, uh, a nice peaceful walk down the Hebble Valley with uh, Tai Chi discs if you fancy using them. Eagle-eyed viewers may have noticed that there's footage from two different days uh, in this video. Uh, it's because I wasn't happy with the content of the, uh, of, of the last attempt, so if you think this video is crap, you should have seen the first one. Not sure if the bench and the uh, memorials in the tree are related. Ah, and more exercise machines. At this point that we are actually finding some proper evidence uh, of the path of the canal. what we are looking at here is what would have been the lock chamber for lock number seven. So I said there was uh, 14 locks in total. We're standing here on lock number seven. Uh, which rose the canal around 100 feet within its distance of about a mile and a half, mile and three quarters. Phoebe Lane was significant because the pumping station was built there to try and preserve uh, and reuse as much water as possible. The clearest trace of the canal that we've found so far, block number seven of 14. So behind me is the canal down to, or would, what would have been the canal down to Salter Hebel. And if we just cross the bridge, we're looking north here, up to Halifax. Each lock was quite deep, averaged about seven feet deep each. Uh, so with tens of thousands of gallons of water being lost with every movement through every lock, um, a solution was needed to try and preserve as much water as possible. We're going to see that solution a bit further down, although it does involve the pumping station at Phoebe Lane. approaching bottoms now uh, and I'm standing on what would have been a unique feature of the canal uh, it's actually bottoms aqueduct uh, the Hebblebrook swings round uh, from right to left uh, and an aqueduct was built over it it's only a small one but it is uh, it is an aqueduct uh, and we're just going to head the final stretch now down into bottoms so the canal would have carried on straight past behind me uh, but the path is taking us round to the left um, when I was a child, Bottoms was all fields and horses. Um, it's now been built on new houses, uh, but there were actually quite a few uh, ponds, I'm guessing for sort of water conservation at Bottoms. Uh, no trace of those now, all lost under uh, new housing. At Bottoms, with the bridge going over the river behind me, and behind me here would have been the bridge going over the canal. Uh, there would have been a lock here uh, in what is now somebody's garden, uh, but this is the bridge going over the canal at Bottoms.
on the final stretch now the canal would have been behind me here so I've been massively uh, infilled and built upon since uh, we're in the final stages now heading down towards Salter Hebel picked up the alignment of the uh, canal again and we know that because I'm actually standing in the middle of what would have been lock number two See the width of the canal it was designed for barges uh, one story I saw uh, was that 36 tons of coal a day uh, was going up the canal just to uh, just to Holsworth Mills alone so we're at Myrtle Cottage where a solution was created for the water problem uh, with each lock empty in sort of tens of thousands of gallons of water with, e with, each, uh, with each use, water was going to become a problem. So the Hebel was dammed just by Myrtle Cottage and an artificial headwater created uh, and water was then diverted down a culvert uh, down to two storage ponds. Uh, from there water was pumped back up the valley up to Phoebe Lane where the pumping station was and then a vertical shaft and a beam engine sent the water up another tunnel to the end of the canal by the Nestle factory where we started this video. So a round trip of a couple of miles uh, of pumping engineering which is pretty impressive I think by any standards never mind for the 1820s. So the culvert's been diverted there and there we have what's left 200 years later, looks like quite heavily silted up of the storage ponds. So that was worth a couple of nettle stings and bramble scratches, uh, I didn't realise that the uh, culvert and the storage ponds we're still there, still working, the culvert's working fine, uh, storage ponds, uh, yeah, they are looking a bit full, but still here, 200 years later. So from there, we're heading back onto the trail, and we are heading into another lock chamber, this time lock number one. So this would have been lock number one, um, we're walking through the chamber underneath the A629, the modern Huddersfield Road. You can see what would have been the original bridge um, and then where it's been extended as the road's been widened over the years. And as we head out of lock number one, Under the bridge, we have a canal. So, this is the only remaining section of the Halifax Arm of the Cauldron Hubble navigation. Very rarely see any boats using this section. Um, I know purists like to. Uh, come up when they are trying to complete the entire canal network um, but it's a, a quiet little stretch um, but we're just a short walk now to where the Halifax Arm meets the main Cauldron Hebel navigation. Until 1996 I think it was 
the Cauldron Hebel navigation did actually terminate in Sorby Bridge. Uh, the canal had been severed in the 60s with road changes in the town because uh, by this stage the, the canals had fallen into uh, neglect and, and disuse. Um, however in 1996 uh, after a campaign to tunnel under Chewell, as in Chewell Lane, uh, two previous locks were combined creating England's deepest lock, Chewell Lane Lock, uh, to reconnect the Cauldron Hebel with uh, the Rochdale Canal. And then in 2002 uh, the obstacles on the Rochdale Canal had been resolved and it's now possible uh, to take a boat all the way on the canal uh, across the Pennines through Rochdale and right into the city centre of Manchester uh, connecting with the other canals there. Still popular I believe with um, leisure boaters uh, but I think the only thing that puts a lot of people off with the Rochdale Canal are the huge number of locks going up to the summit at summit uh, and then descending from summit down into Manchester. Uh, lots and lots of locks. So just come under bridge 10, uh, marking the end of the Halifax arm of the canal. Uh, we have met the main line of the Cauldron Hebel navigation at Salter Hebel Locks. So behind me is the Cauldron Hebel going on towards Sobe Bridge. And behind me here are the locks. Uh, steep drop down uh, through Salt Hebel Locks and then the canal will make its way on through Brig House and on towards Wakefield. The locks on the Cauldron Hebel are different to uh, many others in the system in that they use what is called the Cauldron Hebel Spike to open the locks, which uh, looks like hard work. It is a lovely hot day, uh, there are some kids playing as in actually swimming uh, in one of the ponds further down the locks. Um, given the state of canal water, that looks pretty unappealing even on a hot day. So that's it, the full length of the Halifax Arm at the Cauldron Hebel Navigation. Uh, not much left of it, a couple of interesting uh, pieces, but much of it long gone, forgotten to history. Uh, so what happened to the canal? Uh, well, it didn't own until 1820. The railways came to Halifax, I think, in 1844. I think that's when Halifax Station opened. Um, but apparently, despite that, the canal continued to prosper until well into the 20th century. I'm led to believe that the closure of the Halifax Flower Society didn't help uh, the economic future, I think that was in the 1920s, and certainly by 1942 the canal had been abandoned, uh, certainly into Halifax anyway. Um, Macintoshes bought the area of the canal basin that we saw earlier, uh, bought that in 1957 and built their factory on it, um, the rest of it just neglected and infilled, apart from this little section uh, running up to um, Salter Hebel Hill. I don't think the main line of the Cauldron Hebel ever closed uh, and in some parts, sort of further over towards I think sort of Dewsbury and Wakefield, it was even used commercially sort of well into the sort of 60s, 70s. Um, but yeah, the Halifax Arms long gone, it's never coming back, uh, but it's been a, an interesting little walk down the Hebel Valley. Right, I'm going to head back up the valley towards Halifax now. Um, thanks for watching, hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, please give it a like, subscribe, share, leave a comment, whatever, uh, and I hope to see you on the next video. Music